Hello viewers, if you are familiar to the channel, then thank you for coming back. If you aren't, thanks for tuning in. My name is PJ and this is Serial Chillers, where we cover solved and unsolved true crime stories that focus mainly on serial killers, hence the name. However, we have been known to divert on occasion, as you'll experience in this episode. If this is your kind of thing, then kindly leave us a like and subscribe so you don't miss any future content. In this episode, we will cover the heartbreaking events of arguably one of the most infamous unsolved cases in modern American history. If you are a true crime fan, then you've probably already heard of this case. If not, then please be aware that we are going to cover sensitive subject matters such as filicide and paedophilia. So if any of that subject matter does cause you upset or brings up any emotional memories or trauma, thank you very much for your time. Please do leave the video and we'll see you on another one. Kindly note that due to the sheer complexity of this case, we will be cutting it into two parts, murderous tendencies aside. So in part one, we will cover the background of the case up to the discovery of the body. And in part two, we will look at the suspects, the investigation, and what's happened more recently. So viewers, get cosy, grab a drink, lock the doors. This story takes place in Boulder, Colorado, the United States of America, and involves the brutal murder of six-year-old child beauty queen, John Benet Ramsey. John Benet Patricia Ramsey was born on the 6th of August, 1990, to parents John Bennett and Patricia Ramsey. She had an older brother as well, Burke, who was three years her senior. Now, John Benet is a kind of unusual name, but it actually came from a combination of her father's first and middle names, John and Bennett. I mean, I would have suggested something like John Patsy, but sounds more like a mafioso slang term than someone's actual name. <laughs> John Patsy. That's why I don't name kids. From most resources I've read and watched, it seems that John Bonet had a particularly normal childhood slash upbringing, and there wasn't any particular animosity between her and her brother or her and her parents. Naturally, we can't ask John Bonet directly, um, so we are going off testimony from parents, brother, third parties, but when you look at all of the sources, there doesn't seem to be anything there to cause major concern. Now, John Ramsey was a businessman, and as president of Access Graphics, which was a software company that later became a subsidiary of Lockheed Martin, the famous aerospace company, he wanted his family to be closer to their headquarters, naturally, which happened to be in Boulder, Colorado. So he moved the family there um, when actually John Bonet was only one years old in 1991. Now, Patricia, or Patsy as she was more commonly known as, um, started to enter John Bonet into these child beauty pageants at quite an early age in the local area. Now, John Bonet was touted as a rising star in this world and won numerous titles, including America's Royal Miss, Little Miss Charlevoix, Little Miss Colorado, Colorado State All Star, Kids Cover Girl, and National Tiny Miss Beauty. All titles that, that send shivers down my spine. I just find the whole concept just a little bit creepy. But that's for another day and another channel. Now, it was reported that after John Bonet's murder, her mother, Patsy, actually displayed quite a lot of the what you call pageant mother personality. Now, if you don't know what that actually looks like, then um, let me give you an example. If you've ever watched the show Dance Moms, that should give you a good idea. Alternatively, think Violet Beauregard's mother in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Absolute wacko. So apart from what seems like an overbearing mother and a not very present father, considering his work and what I've read, there wasn't really anything out of the ordinary that could have prepared the family or laid the foundations as an indicator for what happened next. Okay, so picture this, it's now Christmas of 1996. The festivities have been lovely, the family have shared a great time together, um, and it's now rolled over into Boxing Day of the same year. And Patsy Ramsey has been moving around the house as you would do, 
uh, from room to room when she discovers a note on the stairs in the kitchen. Now, of course, random bit of paper is going to pique your interest. She reaches down, picks it up and starts to read it. It's not just any innocent note. It's actually a note containing a ransom demand for her six-year-old daughter, John Bonet. And I quote, Mr. Ramsey, listen carefully. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We respect your business, but not the country that it serves. At this time, we have your daughter in our possession. She is safe and unharmed. And if you want her to see 1997, you must follow our instructions to the letter. You will withdraw $118,000 from your account. $100,000 will be in $100 bills and the remaining $18,000 in $20 bills. Make sure that you bring an adequate size attaché to the bank. When you get home, you will put the money in a brown paper bag. I will call you between 8 and 10 a.m. tomorrow to instruct you on delivery. The delivery will be exhausting, so I advise you to be rested. If we monitor you getting the money early, we might call you early to arrange an earlier delivery of the money and hence an earlier pickup of your daughter. Any deviation of my instructions will result in the immediate execution of your daughter. You will also be denied her remains for proper burial. The two gentlemen watching over your daughter do not particularly like you, so I advise you not to provoke them. Speaking to anyone about your situation, such as police, FBI, etc., will result in your daughter being beheaded. If we catch you talking to a stray dog, she dies. If you alert bank authorities, she dies. If the money is in any way marked or tampered with, she dies. You will be scanned for electronic devices and if any are found, she dies. You can try to deceive us, but be warned that we are very familiar with law enforcement countermeasures and tactics. You stand a 99% chance of killing your daughter if you try to outsmart us. Follow our instructions and you stand a 100% chance of getting her back. You and your family are under constant scrutiny as well as the authorities. Don't try to grow a brain, John. You are not the only fat cat around, so don't think that killing will be difficult. Don't underestimate us, John. Use that good southern common sense of yours. It is up to you now, John. Victory. S. B. T. C. Okay, so weird ransom note to receive, right? I seem to go on and on, there were like two and a half pages of them, as you would have seen just now. Now, my first point is the change in formality in the ransom note it starts off with Mr. Ramsey, but then go on to refer to him later on as John. And then even insulting him, calling him a fat cat. It's like, where's the consistency here? Do you, do you want to go formal? Do you just want to call me a prick? You know, like, where are we going? Second point, small foreign faction. Potentially communist in reference to greed and not liking the country it serves, as in the company. Because Lockheed Martin is an American aerospace company. So, I mean, they kind of align and it fits the narrative. Third point, it's littered with spelling mistakes. Less S's where there should be and more S's where there shouldn't be. People from another country or uneducated. Fourth point, this is the weirdest one, is the exact amount that they requested, the $118,000, was actually later confirmed by John Ramsey that that was the amount of his bonus the previous year from the company. So only someone with access to that sort of information, whether that's inside the company, a third party service provider like a lawyer or an accountant, um, or even someone in the family would have the knowledge to demand that specific amount. There are also references to, to the Bible as well, which there's always a reference to a Bible somewhere. And I doubt someone of John Ramsey's position 
would have been shouting about it in public. You know, there was no TikTok back then, so we couldn't jump into the back of his convertible and go like, woo, look at my money. Ba -ba 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 dollar dollar bills, y'all. Fifth and final point, they mention they are familiar with law enforcement countermeasures, the ransomers. But it just sounds and reads like somebody with the ego who has watched too many films. You wouldn't give up that you had that amount of knowledge if you really knew. You don't want to give somebody an advantage over you. And actually, some of the notes supposedly mirrored dialogue from some of the famous action films of the, the 80s and the early 90s, including Ransom, Escape from New York, and even Dirty Harry. Yes, kidnappers, I am feeling lucky punks. Now I'm jumping ahead slightly, but the FBI were eventually called to discuss the note um, later on in the case and came to the conclusion that it was a very unusual for a ransom note to be written at the scene of the crime. So believed it was staged, as it did not have any fingerprints on it, except for Patsy's and those from the authorities that had handled the note. It also included an unusual amount of initialisms and exclamation marks. I don't know the psychology behind this, um, so I'm not gonna hazard a guess. I mean, I could guess, but I might look really stupid. <laughs> so any of my listeners that do understand this field, then please do feel free to leave a comment below. Educate us. Now, there were no definitive conclusions on the note's author. However, a lot of fingers were pointing at Patsy Ramsey. So after the 911 call was made and the police investigators turned up, within three minutes, might I add, that's a very premium phone number, or premium area, the police officers that arrived conducted a cursory search of the house and couldn't really find any signs of forced entry. One of the officers even went down to the basement and came across a door that was secured by a wooden latch but decided against opening it because, logically speaking, if any intruder had gone out that way, there's no possibility that they could have re-secured the door with the wooden latch, right? However, in my mind, that doesn't mean that that wasn't actually the point of entry, because they could have had another route to exit. So I still would have gone in, but hey, benefit of hindsight, right? Now, with no body found in the house, uh, John Ramsey decided to make arrangements to pay the $118,000 ransom, and a forensics team was dispatched to the Ramsey house. Now, despite the whole Ramsey home potentially being a crime scene, only John Bonet's room was cordoned off, while the rest of the house was a uh, free-for-all. People could wander around without any issues, without being stopped thus destroying any potential evidence. Bravo, Boulder Police. Now to add even more insult to injury and further confirm that the ransom note may have been a ruse or a distraction, the ransom note was never actually followed up on and there was never any attempt to follow up on actually claiming the money. Now at 1 p.m. on December the 26th of 1996, one of the detectives asked John Ramsey and a close family friend of his to search the rest of the house and look for things that may be noticeably out of place. For some reason, they went straight to the basement to check. Now, John Ramsey could have thought, I will literally search the house top to bottom, or in reverse order in this aspect. I mean, logically, I would have done the same. So nothing there to get concerned of. Now, remember that door I mentioned earlier with the wooden latch on that that police officer decided not to open? It is quite important. John opened it and there were a number of adjoining sort of spaces in the basement. And in one of the spaces was his daughter's lifeless body. Now, this part is quite graphic, so I did warn you. John Bonet's mouth had been covered with duct tape, a nylon cord had been tied around her wrists and her neck, and her torso had been covered with a white blanket. Now John, instead of calling the police, proceeded to pick up his daughter's body and carried her upstairs. Now I'm not a parent, but I can imagine if I was, I would just want to get my child out of that situation. So I understand why he did it, but of course, 
he then disrupted the crime scene and again potentially destroyed any evidence that could have been used. Now, following the sad discovery of John Bonet's body, an autopsy was conducted and revealed that she died from strangulation and a skull fracture. No, nothing has been confirmed as to what caused this blunt trauma to the head. The official cause of her death was asphyxia by strangulation. Now, this next part is disturbing again. Now, despite no evidence of conventional rape, sexual assault was not ruled out as there had been evidence of vaginal injury to the girl and that the particular area had been wiped with a cloth. Now also what's even more disturbing that is in a similar fashion to how serial killer John Wayne Gacy killed his victims, John Bonet had had a garrote tied around her neck made from that nylon cord that I mentioned earlier. And at the end of the nylon cord, it was tied to a paintbrush which had been used to gradually tighten the cord and eventually strangle her. Now, part of the bristle end of the brush was found in a tub nearby containing Patsy's art supplies, but the actual handle was never found. The murderer covering their tracks? Okay, watchers. Now, that wraps up part one of this episode surrounding the mysterious case of John Bonet Ramsey. So you don't miss part two, please do like this video and subscribe to our channel and hit that bell notification so you don't miss part two or any future videos that we do. So until then, viewers, stay safe.